unfortunately, we're entering a new phase now, uh, which began actually with the collapse of the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of public interest diminished in that part of the world. So that um, students in, in, enrolled in Russian history classes and the history of Eastern Europe and that sort of thing, and even in Ukrainian history, to some degree, uh, declined. The enrollments declined somewhat. In Ukrainian history, in particular, at the University of Toronto, they didn't decline as much in certain other pl- as in certain other places. Uh, but uh, there was a general decline in Slavic studies. And therefore, uh, university administrations were reluctant to put more money into those fields. So there's a certain uh, resistance to this among the professors who are still working in those departments. But the administration is always trying to cut back. At the same time, within the Ukrainian communities uh, uh, stretched across the country, there is um, a division of opinion. Some people think that they should spend, spend their money and their resources on helping Ukraine because, for example, in these days, as I speak today, Ukraine is at war unofficially with, with Russia and its eastern provinces have been partly occupied by uh, pro-Russian forces. So um, there's a certain urgency that some people feel to help Ukraine in this, uh, emergence, in this emergency situation. Uh, on the other hand, some of these very old libraries uh, in Canada and archives uh, are starved for cash. They don't have money to hire librarians. They don't have money to hire archivists. They don't even have money to hire administrators to, to see that things go smoothly. So those types of uh, libraries, and I think I, I would point once again to, well, I'd point to, to Osteretic, the Center for the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center in Winnipeg. A wonderful old uh, institution uh, dating back to 1944, thrived during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, firstly on Ukrainian private funding and then with some help from multiculturalism beginning in the 80s. Uh, but today it's in a very difficult situation, uh, financially starved, and uh, it contains enormous resources. For example, some of the letters that I used to put together my essay on Gabriel Roy and Stephen Davidovich, his letters to Yevhen Konovalets in particular, I got from the Osiretic archive. They're deposited there. So it contains many treasures of that sort, and they're, they're in danger. And um, I think that um, it would be worthwhile to, to, to preserve these collections if we could. Well, this question of um, what spheres of, of study would be best funded is a, quite a complex one. And it exists on several different levels. I think there is a certain amount of interest in Ukrainian politics. Um, and there is uh, a desire to see the study of, of contemporary Ukraine uh, succeed. At the same time, in Canada, traditionally, we have had uh, very strong um, interests in Ukrainian history and in Ukrainian literature. And these are presently, um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, there there's certain dangers uh, um, with focusing just on politics and nothing else. So in my opinion, there has to be a balance between these things. There has to be a certain amount of funding and support for uh, current Ukrainian politics and its study. And there has to be a certain amount of support for other things like Ukrainian history, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian art, and all of these other fields, which uh, are important in their own right as well. As well, we have to have a kind of balance if we want to preserve our, our community in this country and if we want to see it thrive. We have to have balance between supporting things in Europe, supporting uh, Ukrainian culture in Europe, which some people uh, are very concerned with, and supporting Ukrainian culture here in Canada and our institutions in Canada, because I mean, as I mentioned above, um, some of them are in danger. And the danger is right now is very acute.